collapse of European Imperium. Uh, so what I want to look at is uh, essentially the takeoff stage where uh, decolonization, which had made some headway in Asia, rapidly accelerated, leading to the cataclysmic uh, collapse of most colonial states, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Now, the colonial system didn't just collapse on its own volition. It was pushed down, uh, in many cases, by uh, local nationalist leaders uh, that had to fight for their freedom. This was particularly the case in uh, France, which both in Vietnam and later in Algeria uh, bitterly resisted the demand for sovereignty from its uh, colonial uh, subjects. So in Vietnam, uh, the French had uh, essentially overturned the Ho Chi Minh uh, government, and this had forced them into a long colonial uh, war. Uh, however, at Dien Bien Phu, a elite French army of over 10,000 troops was surrounded by the Viet Minh soldiers. Uh, they were pounded into submission. They were attacked. They were overrun. And ultimately, they had to surrender. So uh, France didn't concede independence to Vietnam. They were defeated on the battlefield. And this really sent a strong international signal that if France, a major power, uh, a great power in the Security Council, could be defeated by nationalist forces, then military resistance truly was futile. It was going to be very expensive in treasure and manpower and what were really the benefits of, of these colonies in that uh, context. Uh, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu was also related, actually, to Algeria's war because, uh, on the, you know, essentially in the aftermath of that defeat, a group which previously had been nondescript, not really existence, the National Liberation Front, declared that Algeria would be free as well. However, uh, from the French point of view, Algeria wasn't a uh, colony at all. It was a département de France. In other words, it was a, a province of Mother France, and they had a lot of European settlers that lived there, over a million so-called pieds noirs, uh, which were essentially the uh, white colonists that had taken control of the best land and uh, exploited the local uh, Muslim uh, population. Uh, but the Muslims challenged uh, the, ca the colonial state. They fought a brutal war. Uh, this was essentially France's second Vietnam. There was over half a million French troops at the height of this conflict. But ultimately, it just proved the futility of, mutu of uh, military resistance. Uh, France couldn't really be defeated uh, on the battlefield per se but they couldn't keep up fighting this colonial war forever either. And it was clear that the uh, Muslim population of Algeria was not going to accept anything less than their freedom. So France had no uh, choice uh, but to withdraw. Now, in many ways, the Algerian war is the, as I noted in the textbook, the, you know, the bloody climax uh, of the decolonization movement after that. It, there's a kind of a seismic shift in the, the European attitudes, the other colonial powers like, you know, Belgium and Britain that, you know, these colonial wars are unsustainable. It, it's not worth it. We got to find a new formula. We're going to have to negotiate with local leaders. And, in, you know, essentially their strategy shifted to finding an exit strategy, getting the best deal possible, supporting groups that they thought would be supportive to their interests rather than just resisting uh, indigenous nationalism with brutal force. There was a fundamentally new climate in the world as well uh, during the uh, 1950s. Uh, one important event was the Bandung uh, Conference. Uh, this was in the hometown of Sukarno, one of the most colorful uh, non-Western leaders of the era very powerful speaker, very powerful uh, you know, advocate for uh, racial justice. During the conference itself, his opening speech was highlighting uh, 
uh, how uh, the world had fundamentally changed. There was no white Western statesman in the audience. The old grizzled men that had in Berlin and, and London made decisions for the rest of the world. Now it was essentially uh, the independent leaders of the Afro-Asian bloc. Uh, so, you know, Tito, uh, Nasser, uh, all these uh, leaders, these independent states were gathered to decide their own fate. So what came out of the Bandung Conference was essentially this momentum, this idea that change was sweeping over the world and that from this point on, no longer would white European states rule the world, but the United Nations would be transformed and would live up to its ideology of racial uh, justice. And that self-determination wouldn't be just a, world, a word, but it would be a realization that would transform uh, the international system. So they talked about many things, how to avoid being caught in the Cold War, how to advocate for freedom for other peoples that were still under colonial rule, and certainly for those that were still under colonial rule, just the news of this event and these ideas excited them and also accelerated uh, nationalist leaders in places like sub-Saharan Africa to mobilize their citizens and challenge European authority. Another important event was the Suez Crisis, uh, when Nasser had nationalized, in other words, expropriated uh, the very profitable Suez Canal Company, uh, which charged a, a toll on ships that were using the, the shortcut between uh, the Mediterranean Sea and uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, the British and the French uh, tried to uh, orchestrate through a conspiracy with Israel to reclaim uh, their, their company. So they actually invaded uh, Egypt to reassert their colonial privileges. But what happened next was pretty surprising. We'll look at this episode a little bit later in the semester. Uh, Britain and France were criticized by not only Moscow, but from uh, Washington. In fact, Washington uh, essentially uh, attacked the British currency, the sterling, forced Britain to retreat from Suez. France had no choice but to follow suit. So the result of the Suez crisis was to highlight uh, the bipolarity of the world system and how the European powers, even great powers, former great powers like Britain and France, no longer had the capability of pursuing an independent foreign policy and that, you know, essentially colonialism uh, was dead in this new international system defined by ideological polarity. Colonialism was no longer uh, appropriate and uh, would no longer be tolerated by international uh, opinion. So this was another event like Dan Bien Phu that was really toxic and toxics to European colonial control and really motivated colonial authorities to switch their focus on how do we negotiate an exit strategy. Now the struggle for independence was different all throughout the globe. I haven't talked too much uh, about Latin America, which has a complicated colonial past, and in some ways they broke apart from European colonialism in the 19th century. However, this just meant that a European elite essentially dominated uh, the non-Western people in their own country. So it, it was really a form of colonialism. Uh, in which essentially the mass of people, uh, most of the peasants, for example, were reduced to a form of indenture and poverty, structural poverty. So Che Guevara was uh, certainly one of the most colorful figures of the post-war era. He had, as an Argentine doctor, signed up with uh, Fidel Castro and played a leading role in the Cuban Revolution. And he became a prominent spokesperson for uh, social justice and the formula for armed struggle. Uh, it was Che Guevara's belief that a revolutionary cell that would challenge a colonial regime in, in Latin America uh, by uh, you know, essentially attacking it, even if it was a very small militant group, the unpopularity of the colonial regime, its inability to 
meet the needs of the people would catalyze a mass movement that would lead to the state's uh, collapse. So this was Guevara's FOCO theory, in other words, the focus theory that a, a small militant vanguard that would take up armed struggle could catalyze the collapse of an unjust uh, colonial regime and enable a socialist regime uh, to come into being to advocate for uh, ordinary people. Before 1957, there was uh, essentially all of sub-Saharan Africa was still under European uh, colonial control, a few exceptions. Uh, in 1957, however, the first kind of chink in the armor appears when Kwame Nkrumah, uh, in a history that I detail more in the textbook, becomes the first uh, African-born leader to ascend to be head of state. And this is, sends a very powerful symbol that Africa's age of freedom is on hand as well. So not only would Kwame Nkrumah be a symbol, but he would also be a catalyst that would help to rally nationalists in other countries to challenge uh, their colonial rule and gain independence in their own right. So the year 1960 represents the climax for the decolonization struggle from a global perspective. I really link it to Harold Macmillan's speech, uh, the British Foreign Secretary, when he was visiting South Africa and talking to the apartheid regime. Uh, he was a uh, very ungrateful guest in you know, poking uh, the apartheid regime that was based on the idea of racial inequality as a fundamental constitutional principle. And what he talked about was what he called the winds of change. The winds of change were blowing over the continent. Africa would soon be free. And this was basically just articulating what was widely felt among the other colonial powers that independence couldn't be stopped, uh, even if they hadn't prepared for it in Africa. And the Europeans would be senseless trying to resist it by armed force that was futile. They had to switch to an exit strategy. So their strategy was really, I mean, it depended on the British and the French, but uh, generally what they look to is various formulas for neocolonialism. And what I mean by that is understanding that they could no longer directly rule uh, Africa. They tried to find an accommodation. They tried to promote so-called moderate elements uh, to transfer power to them with the idea that these moderate elements, these non-communists, would respect uh, the white citizens that might be left behind, but particularly uh, the white corporations that were extracting uh, African, African resources. In other words, the African state would nationalize these corporations and turn their resources over to their own uh, development. So in this way, colonialism in the Cold War often uh, converged, and although the Europeans were quick to embrace the idea of you know, uh, independence and how they were uh, so generous to bestow independence on these people that they dominated for all these years, they were in fact uh, behind the scenes very much influencing events and trying to put the process of independence on a trajectory that would secure their long-term economic uh, interests. So if we look at you know, decolonization from a global perspective in this critical decade from 1956 to its climax in 1960 and then its slow denouement in 1966, what lessons uh, can we draw? Uh, obviously, this was a global story, and it was also a global story that was composed of uh, you know, narratives in individual countries. Uh, certainly, the events in one corner of the globe, like Suez, would have uh, ramifications to other areas, resetting the expectations of both freedom fighters and the colonial powers uh, to negotiate. Uh, in almost all the states, local nationalist leaders in drawing from international precedents or mobilizing international public opinion 
also had to mobilize coalitions that often included diverse groups to focus them against the colonial authority to pressure them uh, to leave. But if we retreat back from this global story, this uh, you know, kind of curve and also a geographic chain moving from Asia, the Middle East to Sub-Saharan Africa, then areas of you know Central Latin America. Generally, what we see is what changed after World War II is that the anti-colonial movement was really powered by mass movements. In other words, nationalism. Uh, the unity of peasants, different ethnic groups, different religious groups around a common program of freedom and racial justice created these powerful coalitions that the European authorities were incapable of resisting. If they resorted to uh, military violence, uh, they were stuck into long, expensive, costly uh, colonial wars. If, if they had to negotiate, uh, they eventually had to surrender sovereignty to uh, local leaders. We see the very powerful use of uh, propaganda following on Gandhi's example and the strategy of Satyagraha. Uh, one of the things that these colonial movements uh, did is they really uh, pointed out the gap between the Western claims of the civilizing mission, the Western claims about self-determination, the Western states about being pro-democracy versus the colonial reality, which is that uh, non-Western people were second-class citizens in their own country. Uh, these were regimes that were you know, based upon racial discrimination. These were regimes that were fundamentally exploitive. These were regimes that were illegitimate. And in exposing these gaps, they were able to rally their people and also to convince the European public that was now more aware about what was going on uh, of the gap between the colonial ideology versus the brutal reality of pacification. Uh, we also see the importance of you know local leaders. I mean, even if decolonization, there was a kind of an inhospitable you know, international climate for colonialism, the Europeans were trying to maintain their, these structures of power. And whether it was Lumumba or Guevara or Aung San or uh, Mao Zedong, in their own environment, they had to navigate, uh, you know, essentially the dynamics in place in their country. They had to mobilize people together. They had to fight the colonial authority, outmaneuver them until they uh, secured victory.